What's up, fellas? Uh, today I wanted to make a video about the use of bands within strength training. So specifically, what are we talking about? We're talking about lifting against bands, not reverse bands. Uh, generally speaking, my rule of thumb is if you have two ways to get a comparable stimulus, one of them is to make a heavier weight lighter, and one of them is to make a lighter weight feel heavier. Uh, generally speaking, we're going to go with making a light weight feel heavier. There's no real reason to go with the reverse other than to stroke your ego. Maybe there's a time and a place to overcome mental hurdle. Um, but more often than not, I think that it should be addressed by making the person more confident in their approach and their preparation rather than using an easier motion to touch heavy weights. I don't think, I think that's a false confidence and people tend to know it's a false confidence too. So they're like, oh, well, yeah, I have, you know, reverse band squatted 600, but it's a whole other beast doing it without the reverse bands. Did that really build you all that much confidence? Not so much. It's not really my thing. So specifically, we're talking about lifting against the bands. So a little bit of strength history for those who are unfamiliar. There was a period of about 15 years where nearly all lifting was equipped, specifically multiply. And when you're lifting in a suit, the degree to which the suit helps you varies across the range of motion, right? So the lower we get in the squat, the more assistance we're getting from the suit. And in that regard, the amount of force we have to output is actually variable based on the range of motion. What does this mean? It means that there's some level of inherent specificity to accommodating resistance if we're talking equipped lifting. So if we assume that the best results achieved during this time are kind of reflective of best practice, obviously we never reached, there weren't enough people doing the sport, we never reached anywhere near the limits of what the capabilities of multiply lifting were, but if we, you know, if we look and say, the, okay, the emerging strategies that were producing the best results, the use of bands was very prevalent. So we could say, yeah, there's some level of inherent specificity to the bands. It kind of makes sense. It's the same reason that box squats were very prevalent. Um, much the same as a box squat, you don't necessarily really have to support yourself to the same degree at the bottom of a quip squat. So these motions have a little bit more relevance to the task at hand. And then you also have the, the crazy accommodations needed based on the fact that we're like we're lifting extremely super physiological weights so that we can't train in this super specific manner that has come about in raw lifting um basically what this led to is when lifting started to become raw um, people didn't necessarily adapt their methods and really tried to fit a round peg into a square hole and say no accommodating resistance has been what makes the strongest athletes the best guys do accommodating resistance just as much as they train straight weights if not more and it led to this uh, abundance of overuse of accommodating resistance as a training strategy um, since then people have figured out that specificity exists and, um, you know, if our goal is to move the most straight weight possible, just by the nature of specificity, the majority of our training should be against straight weight. But that being said, just like the fitness pendulum always swings, one thing's good and we go super far in the other direction and it never has a time and a place, more than likely it isn't useless. I'm going to go out and let me say that. Um, if we look at one example, uh, Mike Tuscher, who I believe to be one of the greatest coaches of all time, and that's very much reflected in the number of IPF champions that he's produced, very flexible thinker, has produced world-class athletes in a variety of weight classes all the way from light females to heavy men so that kind of tells you he's got a very very good understanding of the training process his whole thing is emerging strategies and reactive programming based on we observe what works and then we continue doing it until it stops working we take a pivot we do exploratory blocks we continue doing what works until it stops working right and um i i hold him in very high regards one of my go-to resources for learning about the cutting edge of strength training and um He's no, he's not opposed to the use of accommodating resistance. If you follow some of his athletes, many of them will run a training cycle where they're squatting or deadlifting or benching against chains or using bands. Just the other day, he posted, um, I have no idea what the guy's name is, but this Swedish 184 IPF world champion from this year, um, he was saying that they found observationally that when they're running one straight weight session and then one deadlift session of sumo against bands um, per week, that that's when they saw the best results. And there's no long drawn out, here's why this is the case. It's just, hey, we've observed that when this motion is present, our rate of progression and estimated 1RM is greater. So we're going to do that motion whenever we're for getting ready for a competition. Let's not try to read into and come up with these really complicated and 
largely speculative explanations for why. And I think you guys have heard about, um, heard me talk about why I use the banded overhead press. I'm not as concerned with the physiological reasons why that is such a good accessory as I am with the fact that it works and I'm going to continue to do it until that trend dissipates. So I would say that it's not something that's completely useless. It's just something that was heavily overused based on kind of the history of strength training and powerlifting. But it's not this completely archaic concept that we should look down on people for using. Um, and some, depending on who's listening to this, someone might tell me, oh, well, people much stronger than you have used bands regularly, right? And that's absolutely true. But if we're going with a call to authority and we're going with that logical fallacy, we have to ride it out all the way. If we look at the top 10 powerlifters in the world, uh, none of them are using bands as a real centerpiece of their training. You'll see guys use them sparingly here and there, or maybe they'll have a specific reason that one day they're lifting against bands, but they're not the cornerstone of training that they once were, and the results have gone up and up and up. So maybe training isn't ideal yet, but we are slowly approaching best practice, more than likely for raw lifting. We're getting closer, and that's kind of reflected in the results. Um, so I would say that, you know, if we're going with the call to authority, uh, yeah, there's people that better than me that have heavily used bands, but there's people better than them who have not used bands at all, such as Ed Cohn, if we're going really back far in time, or if you look at most of the best raw power lifters, either tested or untested currently. Um, so now that we've got the intro out of the way, we're going to kind of move into two segments to this video. The first one is talking about the use of bands on the primary lifts. When I say primary lifts, I, all I really mean is compounds where we're interested in maximizing a one rep max, right? So anything where maybe that's what we're training for, maybe it's a three rep max, the motions where these are our displays of strength. There also are ways of building strength, but these are the displays of strength that we're concerned with building up. Um, the, the thing about that is, what do we want to do? We want to lift the most straight weight possible. So there's an inherent lack of specificity to bands, right? If what we're training for is the largest amount of straight weight that we can lift, uh, lifting against a large percentage of the weight being bands is probably not a great idea. Um, I personally recommend never using heavy bands. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, like I said, there's an inherent lack of specificity there. The strength curve being so substantially different than what we're trying to build up um, just makes it so that the most successful motor pattern you could use for lifting, you know, 300 pounds plus 300 pounds of bands isn't the same motor pattern that would be the best for picking up 600 pounds of straight weight from the floor. We're going to use uh, more or less compensatory motor patterns to try to advantage this different lift. And then we don't want those motor patterns bleeding into our straight weight lifting. So that's one issue. Um, and then another big issue, is, like aside from the skill component, is that it removes the uh, stability largely from the bar. If anyone who's lifted against really heavy bands probably knows what I'm talking about because there's some level of forward and back pressure from the bands as well. Your need to stabilize the bar front to back almost goes away. Um, and if you're lifting against really heavy bands as I have at some point because I've tried everything, um, it feels like a free weight machine hybrid. Like you can really get out of the groove and the bands are gonna pull you right back into it. And if we do a large amount of our training um, using these bands that are taking away that stability component, I've seen it more times uh, than I care to count, the people I've seen use bands you know, for more than 50% of their training and they're heavy bands, you put them under a free weight and they have genuine balance issues front to back. They'll sit back too far or they'll hit the hole and they'll get pitched forward because they're not accustomed to having to stabilize the weight front to back. Um, and then last of all is if we have this huge discrepancy in bottom and top weight, um, if we just think biomechanically, right? You know, we have all these remnants from equipped lifting where people are like, oh, don't train your quads in the squat, just train your posterior chain, or oh, don't train your pecs for the bench, just train your triceps. And then people apply these concepts to raw lifting. Um, yeah, if you don't, if you've got a squat suit that takes away the most demanding part of the lift from the quads and does it artificially, then yeah, you could probably get away with spending more time training your posterior chain. If you have a bench shirt that acts as artificially strong pecs, we can probably get away with putting that extra training economy into the, but if we take away that shirt, we need to train those muscles. That's not that crazy. And just mechanically speaking, the deeper ranges of motion are the more challenging portions of the lift, just mechanically speaking. Even if you miss high in the lift, more often than not, the reason you missed high in the lift is because you fudged your position in the bottom portion. 
um, to get the bar moving. So if someone who misses at lockout, uh, off the ground is the mechanically difficult part of the lift, but you let your back round to get yourself, like your arms a little bit longer, shorten your torso artificially, and made it a little easier off the ground, which isn't inherently bad. But the reason you're missing at the top isn't because the top is inherently that hard, it's because you made the off the ground a little easier. And um, by making the weights really light in the most challenging portion of the motion, our ability to build up our raw lifts kind of diminishes, right? So if you use that extreme example of 300 pounds of straight weight and 300 pounds of bands, uh, well, if this person is a 500 pound squatter, 300 pounds in the hole for is presumably a single is not challenging the most difficult portion of the range of motion much at all and it doesn't offer the stimulus where we need the stimulus the most so that was a little bit babbly i hope you got the point of it but we're going to get into um what what would i recommend if we are going to use bands on the main lifts because i do i'm going to recommend that we use lighter bands so how are we going to find lighter bands if if you're someone who quantifies your band tension probably about 10% of the straight weight. So if you've got 400 pounds on the bar, 40 pounds of band tension can be appropriate, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Um, anything less than 5% is probably not doing anything. So it's why even bother setting them up? Anything more than maybe 15%, you're probably changing the motor pattern a little bit too much. But if we use light bands, um, we're, the bands are not gonna off. Like those little red bands that I use, they're not offering a significant amount of lateral stability. So we're still developing the motor skills that we're looking to have. And the amount of weight in the most challenging position, the bottom range of motion, whether it be an overhead press or a squat, is still going to be a substantial enough percent percentage to offer us some good training stimulus. So why would we use the bands, right? One of them is just to keep things interesting. If you're like, oh, well, shit, uh, my level and my recovery capabilities dictate that I should be squatting three times a week and practicing my motor skill. And that just kind of gets a little bit boring. I don't get to chip rep PRs all that often. Um, one thing we can do is introduce a very minor deviation of the, the strength curve, right? We're still getting that practice in. We're still practicing our setup. We're still practicing our back tightness. We're still practicing the same cadence and we're still hitting the hole with a, a uh, relevant percentage for each portion of a training cycle right so we're getting the benefits and it could be just a novelty right on some level um, another one you know you could argue that it's not that important is maybe we get some technical benefit out of it just knowing that the weight is getting heavier as you come up forces you to try to maintain good strong positions rather than doing what we talked about earlier which is compromising your positions right from the get-go so if you know that by the lockout of the bench uh, it's going to weigh 10 percent more you're probably going to be forced to keep better back tightness and not just press out of your retraction. Um, kind of the same thing with an overhead press. If you know at the top it's about to be 10% more, you're probably gonna fight to maintain your upright posture rather than lay back into a position where it's gonna be really tough to deal um, with that added 10% weight. So some people can get some technical benefit from that rising weight as we come through the range of motion. And then the final thing that I like about it is you can shift the muscular emphasis of a lift without getting rid of the necessarily the the potency of the skill practice. So the most concrete example I have for you guys of this benefit is uh, if we're bench pressing and we, for whatever reason, come to a conclusion that our triceps specifically could probably be a bit stronger. Um, conventional wisdom tells us that we should probably do um, a bench press with a grip closer than our regular grip. The problem is that we don't get to practice our back tightness in the same way with a closer, closer grip than we do with our regular grip. The alternative to this, rather than just lengthening the range of motion, you know, bringing the grip in, we could keep the same grip and alter the resistance curve a little bit to challenge the triceps using some light bands at about 10%. This way we get to practice our true competition style bench an additional time each week, but we also achieve our goal of shifting the emphasis towards the triceps to some degree. The nice part is as long as that band tension is truly light to moderate, we're still getting the quality pec training that we should be, we're still getting the technique, and it's just a small deviation in stimulus. It's different enough to do something, but it's not so different that we're practicing a completely different skill. So I'd say that's where the real value comes in. Um, even on my squats, I'm, I don't know what the band tension is and I should probably measure it, but I'd imagine it comes out to be about 10%, maybe 15% of my squats, which is probably a little bit much, but um, that's my general rule of thumb for how I'm going to use them 
if I were to implement them in my or someone I coach's training program. And then we're going to get to the last part of this video, which is bands on non-main lifts, so lifts that we're not interested in displaying or strength on. Um, that um, 1RM is inherently meaningless. So hypertrophy focus work, bodybuilding work, whatever you want to call it. This is kind of where bands get kind of interesting to me, right? There is no inherent specificity to these motions. That makes things very interesting, right? Because the goal is the stimulus. The goal is not the weight on the exercise. So we have a lot more flexibility so long as we're achieving the general stimulus that we're looking for. Um, basically, you know, we can match the resistance and the strength curve up. Um, so basically, a perfect example would be a hack squat. The higher we get up in a range of motion, if you did a hop, top half partial, you could lift more weight. If you did a top quarter partial, you could lift more weight. So the higher up in the range of motion we are, the more force we're capable of outputting. You could imagine this with a leg press, you could imagine this with a chest press, whatever it might be. The higher up in the range of motion we are, the more force we could potentially output. And by using bands, we can match up the resistance curve to the strength curve. So we're kind of challenging the full range of motion, not just the bottom most position. Um, is this that much better? No, we don't really have any peer-reviewed evidence to suggest that matching up the strength curve with the resistance curve makes it so much more of a potent stimulus. So as long as we're doing the right number of sets and taking them to the right like proximity to failure and we're training through a full range of motion, um, regardless of kind of how that strength curve is oriented, it's probably gonna be similar, but A, you might enjoy it more and people push themselves harder on things they enjoy more. B, it can feel a lot easier on the joints using the example of a hack squat. Um, C, if you feel it's driving good results for you, it very well might be, especially if you've been training for long enough to kind of tell those things. You're like, hey, I get better results from this deviation of the motion where I alter it. Um, just kind of using the practical examples, the banded hack squat is going to be my go-to example for this. Most hack squats, unless you have a really nice one, uh, will kind of bang up your knees even if you're executing them well with good control, full range of motion, and well-selected weight. They can still bang up your knees. If you attach a medium to heavy reverse band, and we alter that strength curve. So in our weakest position, it's a little lighter. In our strongest position, it's a little heavier. Often uh, that like deleterious effect on the knees will go away completely. It just becomes a better exercise. Um, we can think of a ton of different examples of, you know, machines where we can alter that strength curve. And it probably just makes it a little, it's like the same exercise, but a little bit better, maybe 1% better. And if you've got the bands, you've got the money, you keep them in your bag, it's not a big deal. It's just a nice little um, improvement to some of your bodybuilding exercises. I hope I say this right. Um, but my boy, Bald Omni Man, I hope I said that right because I like that guy a lot. He's very nice. Um, he specifically asked why I was doing banded deficit RDLs, right? This is a bodybuilding motion for me, right? Um, to some degree, you could say it's a variation of the deadlift, but the motor pattern I find is different enough that I would maybe classify it as almost more of just a general hinging movement. Um, so I have a little bit more flexibility. I can rotate with time as different stimuli I kind of peter out and I can't beat the books anymore. I'll make a small deviation, whether it be moving to a deficit, doing my RDLs actually to a block, so a little bit smaller range of motion. And recently I've been messing around with also just fiddling with the strength curve. Um, generally speaking, when I do a deficit RDL, I feel as though my hamstrings are being well, like taxed quite well, my lower back is being taxed quite well. Um, but I never found that I was pushing my glutes anywhere near their capacity. So I was like, oh, well, I guess I could toss some bands down and I could maybe challenge the range of motion across, the, I could challenge the full range of motion a little bit more, including the upper end of the range of motion, um, the part that's the most demanding on the glutes, and maybe it would just be a better general posterior chain exercise, and so far so good. Um, it's nothing magical, hasn't done anything crazy, but it's just a small deviation from the exercise that I found made it a little bit more well-rounded for general muscle building purposes. Um, I think that would be another example is like an RDL maybe isn't a machine, but depending on how we're fitting it into our program, that could kind of fit the, the bill for more of a hypertrophy focused exercise or more of a strength focused exercise. And in my case, because it's a hypertrophy focused exercise, I do have that flexibility uh, to fiddle with it a, a little bit. Thankfully, um, when I was trying this, I already had come to my 10% band uh, tension conclusion. So I knew to make sure that the straight weight was still a weight that could challenge me in the bottom ranges of motion. Otherwise, I don't think this would be giving me very much correlation to my deadlift at all. But because it's, um, it's not that much less than what I would do on a regular deficit RDL, uh, it ends up working out okay for me. Um, Last note for these. I, I hope I've sold you on the guys on the idea that this is something that you can play around with in your own training. Um, the big thing is buy your own bands. The ones at the gym get broken down really quickly. They get switched out. Even if your gym is super solid and there's always buying new ones, 
buy your own bands and make sure that the band tension and the band rigging is the same every time. If we are just basically customizing these exercises, uh, they need to be consistent. That way when we beat the books and we apply progressive overload, we know it's true progressive overload. If we're using a different band rigging every constantly, it's, it's kind of come into that conjugate dilemma of, okay, am I achieving consistent progressive overload? I don't know. If we know that the band tension is a fixed variable, we can achieve progressive overload by increasing the weight. And I think that's something I probably should have mentioned as well in the uh, beginning. Don't vary the band tension. Progressive overload should be uh, achieved by manipulating the straight weight because the straight weight is the goal. Specific specificity dictates that, okay, we have, even if we have this small 30, 40 pound deviation weight top to bottom, the manipulation should be done with the underlying straight weight because that's what we care about. And much the same on the bodybuilding motions, we don't overload by adding more bands. If you add more bands, track it as a new exercise. So maybe you get to the point where your leg press can't hold any more weight plus the band, so you're like, okay, well, I'll move to a heavier band and then work my way back up the stack. Just start tracking that as a new exercise, beat the books, you know, lay down some new rep PRs, beat them the next week, add a rep, add a rep, and then add some weight, add a rep, add a rep, add a rep, drop the reps, add some weight, so on and so forth. Um, but that would be my main tip, is just make sure that the band tension is uh, very consistent if we're gonna be utilizing these, either for our main lifts or our bodybuilding work. I hope you guys like my video. Uh, as always, thank you very much for watching them. It means a lot to me.